The following interview was conducted with Scott Mandernack, the librarian for the John W. Hicks Undergraduate Library at Purdue University for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, October 1, 2008 in Stewart Center. Welcome, Scott, and thank you very much. Thank Tell you. us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay. Um, I was born in Kenosha, Wisconsin, um, 1957. Uh, my parents are Ralph and Shirley Mandernack. Uh, my dad is, was a pharmacist, and he has been retired now for a number of years. Uh, my mom uh, did not get higher education before all of her children were born, but after my youngest brother was born and off to school, she finally decided to go back to school. And so she, you know, one course by one course, went to the University of Wisconsin Parkside, which is in my hometown, and took a course at a time, and over the course of probably 20-some years, she actually got her degree a year after she retired. <laughs> so, What'd she get her degree in? Uh, I think just like, like liberal arts or something like that, so okay. a very general degree, but sure. uh, she just did it for the general great. education of it. Up. That's, That's right. Great. That's right. And, you know, that was a real, she was a real role model for me in that. I was so proud of her for making that commitment to doing it in spite of having four kids to deal with and she was working full time the whole time she was going to school obviously my dad was working full time and and yet she she, she made that line. obligation to herself and she did it and it just always impressed me right. so I that was, was pretty neat what was early years through your grade school and then tell us about high school what you did in high school activities etc um in grade school um i was um well, let's see. I went to Summers Elementary in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, the first year I went to kindergarten was in the main building. Uh, my first and second grade years were in, and kind of, I don't know if it was like an overflow building or something. It was a little three-room schoolhouse out in the country. And actually, I have the best memories of those two years than any of them. Why did you have to go school. to this other school? I think that the other school was just too crowded. They okay. didn't have enough classrooms. And so in my second grade class, actually, I was only one, one of six second graders in the school. There were three classes of first graders, and then six second graders were incorporated into one of those classes. So we had lots of independence in that class. It was really much fun. Um, <laughs> I remember teaching the class how to do art projects and things like that, and we just, you know, when the teacher was doing things with the first graders, we would be off doing our own things, you know, studying or, or fun things or whatever it was. But I, I always remember that. I can still remember the, most of those other five kids in my second grade class as a result Pretty of that. Good. So it was yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, then I went back to the main school for third and fourth grade, and then fifth and sixth, boundaries changed, and I had to move to another elementary school still in Kenosha. And I then went to a brand new junior high school, Bullen Junior High School and was the first graduating class from that, and that would have been in, what, 1971 or two, something like that. And then my high school was Bradford High School in Kenosha, and I graduated from there in 1975. Um, and while I was in high school, I was very involved, actually junior high and high school, I was very involved in the band. I played, what instrument did you I play? played clarinet in the concert band, and also E-flat clarinet, and I played cymbals in the marching band. Sometimes I played clarinet too, but uh, the, the later years I played cymbal, and that was a lot of fun. A very different experience from what I was accustomed to at bands. So. And you went to all the games? Uh, a mm -hmm. lot of games. We did a lot of competitions. Kenosha was really phenomenal in their support for the music programs in the, in the in whole the city. Schools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had real competition between the high school concert bands and the marching bands, and um, it was it was really a lot and of fun. And you went to some state ones, probably. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. We traveled all over the state and and the Midwest actually, so it was it was great fun. I was involved in the student council in high school. Um, that was my very first year, I think. I was in the student council and was served in that for two years. Then my last year of high school, we only had uh, sophomore, junior, senior in high school there. My last year, I started taking classes at the local campus of the University of Wisconsin system. And so I was taking two classes each semester during my senior year, and so I only went to high school for half a day. And as I thought of it, I was getting a head start on my college experience and all. Um, I would say there were probably mixed reactions to that. I kind of felt like I didn't belong in either place because I wasn't really immersed in the environment enough. 
So you. yeah, 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 yeah. But I have good memories of it. I, and I started working in the uh, UW Parkside Library as a student while I was uh, in that my senior year of high school. And I loved that. I loved it. Um, I had no intentions of being a librarian at that time, but I just enjoyed the work a lot. And uh, how large was the is that campus there? Is it good at the time, it was about I think thirty five hundred students, so relatively small. Um, but the the library there, uh, for those who know much about library instruction, um, the the director of the library at the time I was there was Joe Boise and the Director of Public Services, I'm not sure if that was the exact title, was Carla Stoffel, who is now a real icon in terms of uh, library leadership in, sure. in the profession. So um, th my exposure to them, I think, just kind of bled into me. <laughs> and so I had these foundations of librarianship and the interest in it before I even realized it myself consciously. I remember when I was about to graduate from college which I was graduating in with a degree in sociology and anthropology. Um, but Carla came up to me and suggested I consider librarianship. And I just outright said, oh, no way, I'm not interested in that at all. <laughs> so I had all these intentions of going on to grad school and, and all that kind of thing, so in anthropology. Um, once I graduated. Did you, then you went full time to, to Parkside campus? And finish at Wisconsin? Yeah. Or you did yeah, 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 yeah. I did finish okay. up there. After you got out of high school. You right, did. right, right, right. I, I stayed there and I was working as a library assistant the whole time. I actually was a, a library worker for five years because of that year prior to my uh, final graduation there, too. They were in the, in the midst of um, creating this whole series of library instruction workbooks. And I got tapped to trial some of those workbooks before they actually used it on some of the students in the classes. And so I think I did about three or four of their workbooks. And so again, it was just another way that this instruction bug kind of got into me without my realizing it. But so then when I graduated, I obviously left that job. And I, I took up a job that I was looking for any kind of thing at the time. And I ended up finding a custodial job at the Racine Public Library, which is the city just north of Kenosha. And obviously, I wasn't very stimulated by that job intellectually, so I decided after uh, six months or so of being there that I wanted to go back to grad school. The closest grad school to where I was living was University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And they didn't have an anthropology program that I was particularly interested in, which was my goal. So I thought, well, in the meantime, I could go to the library school and learn how to do research so that when I went on to get my doctorate in anthropology, I'd be better prepared and know how to take advantage of the resources that were available to me. Well, so I started going part-time. And uh, by that time, I had gotten married. And a year after I got married, we had our first child. And so the year of my graduation, my first daughter was born. And I was ready to move out of the custodial line of work. And so I started looking for other jobs. And my first professional job then was at Temple University in Philadelphia. And I uh, started there in 1983. And so. In the library? In the library. Oh, yeah. so you got to library school? Yeah, yeah. So, so I went to library school. So you continued on? Yeah. I was so, frankly, I was desperate to get out of the custodial job because I just I couldn't take it much longer. What I was qualified to do at the time was be a librarian. So that's what I did. And you had all that experience in the school since yeah. you were younger. Right? Yeah. And I had thought I would still go on to grad school in anthropology at some point. Um, after my first year of working in the library, though, um, at, uh, at, at Temple. This was oh, at Temple. Temple. Yeah. Uh -huh. My grad degree was at UW Milwaukee. But then I took my first job at Temple University in Philadelphia. And my boss there, her name was Fran Hopkins. Um, she had done some writing in instruction areas uh, in librarianship, and uh, so she was a really good mentor for me. And I knew she had been doing some work on topics about the sociology of knowledge and sociology of librarianship and things like that. So I started rethinking my grad school options, and I, by the time I left there two years later, I was thinking I was going to go on to grad school in librarianship and or sociology and combine those two. And so I explored the possibilities of a doctorate in sociology and or librarianship. But um, again, uh, we moved on from Philadelphia after two years. Uh, 
this was in 1983 to 1985. And you were at Temple. In I was at Temple, mm -hmm. and my salary was so low there that, and this is as a professional librarian, I actually, this is an interesting story, <laughs> I actually had to take a pay cut of about $6,000 to go from a custodian to a librarian in 1983. But I did it because I needed to get into the profession, I felt, and so um, we moved to Philadelphia. But the salary was just so low that I just I couldn't take advantage of all that the city had to offer, and so I was very unhappy there. Um, what was your position there? What were you doing? I was a reference uh, librarian oh. and bibliographer. Um, I was a bibliographer for sociology, anthropology, criminal justice, uh, social welfare, gerontology, social science oh, areas. Social, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Well, sociology falls within all yeah. those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it kind of fit my background and where sure, I was you hoping had an to go. In that. So, yeah. And, and so, um, but I was most interested in the instructional services component of the job. Um, in fact, my master's degree program. Uh, I had a, a thesis or a project to do for my master's degree and what I did was work with one of the librarians at the University of Wisconsin Parkside in developing one of those research handbooks or workbooks that they were creating in the field of anthropology. So we were hoping to get that far enough along that the librarians would then get it published as sure. part of that series. And so when I went to Temple, they were taking advantage of that interest and they were looking at rewriting their research guides, I think, uh, for students. And they were looking at, at the time, there was this real shift going on in the profession in terms of library instruction. Uh, this was the early years of the growing movement towards library instruction. At the time, it was called bibliographic instruction. And um, there was a, a shift just beginning at the time I was at Temple to start going away from the uh, source-based instruction where we just taught people how to use certain books or indexes or whatever, but to start thinking about instruction more conceptually. And so that's what a group of us at Temple were trying to do at the time. And so we were kind of, yeah, putting it into the broader context and thinking about more the decision-making processes rather than just how to use this resource or using this particular database or whatever. So uh, I got involved in the instruction program. I was appointed coordinator of the information and reference desks there, which was basic stuff. There was no staff supervision in that role. I was just making sure that there were communications about changes in policies and procedures and things like that made uh, clear to everybody. But um, I also got in, invited to participate in a, it was an OMLS study on the organization of the library. and. I found that to be a real fascinating aspect of they the field, too. Yeah. I don't remember if they got a grant. I, I was the name sort of rings a bell. There okay. were some the, those acronyms. Yeah. OMLS was the Office of Management, Office of Library Management Studies, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they had consultants come in and meet with mm -hmm. the staff, and there were lots of different task forces and things going on. So I just, this, again, this just kind of planted a seed for me on having this real interest in organizational cultures and things like that and so I had a chance to get involved in that. Shortly before I left, as I said I only stayed there two years because of the financial considerations primarily. I loved the job but I just, I just couldn't afford living in the city. Um, but they actually uh, appointed me to be interim coordinator of the online search services. So I did that for a few months and that was really my first exposure to online searching. And as you know, <laughs> that was mediated searching in those days. So clients came to us and explained what they needed, and then we did the searching. And so um, I did that for a few months, and I was told by uh, someone else who was very actively doing online searching that I had a particularly strong acumen for online searching because so much logic was involved in constructing good search statements, and he was really pleased with me with doing that. So. That felt good <laughs> to get that compliment there. It's so early in my career. <laughs> so um, after two years at Temple, uh, I decided I needed to start looking elsewhere, and I ended up going back to Wisconsin to another UW campus, this time in UW-Whitewater. Um, I went there as an information and instruction librarian. That was the title we had there. This was a, um, 
one of the many branch campuses of the University of Wisconsin system, um, about 45 minutes or so away from Madison, which is the main campus. So while I was at um, Whitewater, um, I did a lot of reference work. That was really the major component of my job there. They, the, the things that I, I really learned at that job, though, were they had a strong business program there. And so I learned a lot about business reference, some legal reference, because they had a strong business uh, or legal business law program there. And, and so those are very new, new subject fields for me, sure. nothing I had ever had ex a lot of experience with. At Temple, we had specialized libraries, and so the business ones went away from the general library. So I didn't have much uh, experience with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I had a good experience with that at Whitewater, and I also became a co-coordinator of the online services at Whitewater as well. And this was in the day when CD-ROMs were just beginning to come out, and so we were working at building a CD-ROM center. I remember having this separate little location in the library with computers set up with each one having a separate CD-ROM loaded onto it. And of course, Eric was the first one that we all had, so. <laughs> but, um, so that was, that was a good experience. But what I found there was that there was a limit to how much more I would learn. And so I started kind of getting antsy to learn more and kind of enhance my skills a little bit further. Uh, so I started looking, and uh, I found this job at Purdue. And so in was it advertised? It had been advertised. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I probably found it in the Chronicle, I imagine. Right. Um, and it was for the reference and instruction librarian position in the undergraduate library. Um, so I applied, and I think I interviewed in February. Interestingly, on a uh, a Purdue IU game day, and I had just happened to wear a black suit with a yellow tie that day. I had no idea this the must Purdue have been colors, a but game. it worked out well. Bobby, <laughs> so, Bobby Knight. Oh, basketball! Right, right, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's probably in what February. It was. Yeah. In February. That's right. That's right. So anyway, um, I, I got the job, and I started in July of 1990 as the reference instruction librarian in undergrad. And so, I've been here ever since. And then tell us now. Then uh, when you. The person who was the librarian at the head left, then you got the position as head of the Yeah, that happened um, about 12 That's years up. later. Right. Um, so for 12 years, uh, Judy Pask was the head of the undergraduate library when I came in, and she held that position until 2002, I think it was, when she left. She retired. And um, so while I was doing those, or during those 12 years, um, I basically supervised and coordinated all the reference and instructional services of undergrad. Uh, at the time, we had one other reference and instruction librarian. Is that a, pro a professional? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, that was Poping Lin, yeah, if you remember her. But, um, and then we also had a librarian who was in the IMC, that was Carl Snow, and another librarian who was the media and instructional design librarian. That was okay. Roberta Kramer. Uh, I think she was Roberta Kovacs when I first came. And so it was a five librarian library at the time. And so um, I supervised anywhere from five to six reference staff. And eventually we kind of looked at, um, there was a real divide between the reference and circulation staff in undergrad when I first arrived. And so one of the ways we worked to overcome that division in staff was to have the reference instruction librarian co-supervise the circulation staff with the circulation uh, supervisor, which at the time was Mary Ann Eldridge, or Mary Ann Day. And so we started this kind of cooperative supervision uh, approach in undergrad, and it, it uh, in some form continues to this day. We found it to be very successful and uh, really unified the staff and kind of developed this common vision about undergrad and its mission. And so. Let me ask you, at the same time, you're also doing some sharing with some of the other libraries. Is that going on? You, you take trade, say, with the Hissy Library yeah. reference? Yeah, in about, um, when was that? About 1995 or so, okay. we started a reference exchange program. Okay. Initially, it was a couple of librarians from undergrad going to Hissy, a couple of librarians from Hissy coming to undergrad. Um, uh, within a year or two, we expanded to include the, uh, what was then referred to as the Craner Library, the Management and Economics Library. And so we had libraries and library and staff as well 
exchanging among all those different libraries. Our intent uh, from the undergrad perspective was to try to get a better sense of the resources available in the Hissey Library, which was one of the strongest referral libraries for our clientele. And also... And, here, and for the researchers, you were close together, you're connected. Right, Same right. building, just a... Right, yes, all exactly, away. exactly. Um, but we had also worked real hard to develop a real strong service ethic in the, among the reference staff in undergrad, and we wanted to try to share that with other libraries, too. Um, I think we have developed a good reputation in undergrad for having a strong emphasis on quality service at, at our service desks. And so um, we just wanted to expand that and, and uh, learn more for ourselves and you know, try to show others another way of, of serving those undergraduates too. We c that's when we started realizing that there was kind of a, a qualitative difference between the reference service in undergrad from the other libraries. And we've come to characterize it as the reference service that we provide in undergrad is very process oriented whereas uh, compared to the service that most people tend to get in the other subject libraries are more resource oriented. And they're the upper division uh, scholars and researchers that they know how to do the research, they are looking for specific pieces of information that the librarians can help them with. In undergrad, we would get the same kind of questions day in and day out, but the challenge for us was to make sure that we come off as fresh and inviting to every single student that comes our way regardless of what their question is. Even if you've had it a hundred times that same day, you need to make sure that you see how their perspective on that question is unique and, and how we can best address it. So that's really become an underlying philosophy of undergrad, I think, is to For the really researchers, are you serving uh, primarily for undergrad was set for, for the freshman and sophomore year? Right. Okay. Very but distinctly in the first years that I was here. Um, I came when undergrad was only about eight years old. Right, it opened in 1982. Right, right. And um, <clears throat> in more recent years, our vision for undergrad services have really expanded a bit. Um, probably since about 2002, when the Digital Learning Collaboratory was installed and implemented in undergrad, we Let's really stop for a moment. Tell the researchers what that was, that okay. DLC. Okay. Yeah. The Digital Learning Collaboratory was um, kind of Purdue's take on a, a growing movement in librarianship towards what's being referred to as an information commons environment. Uh, it's where there's a stronger integration between the technology and the library services that are offered and available to students. And so a, a lot of institutions have moved towards this greater integration of technology into library spaces. So um, Cheryl kern Simarenko, the associate dean at the time, John Campbell, who was the uh, director of teaching learning technologies in ITAP, which is the in, uh, information technology division of, of Purdue, and I worked to develop a proposal to put in this shared collaborative space jointly run between the libraries and ITAP to provide enhanced services that combines information literacy with technology literacy. And so um, in 2002, early spring, we submitted a proposal and worked up a funding uh, estimate for it and all to put this in the lower level of the undergraduate library where the former instructional media center had been housed on the lower level. And it had been vacant for a couple of years when we integrated the media collection into the general shelving collection upstairs on the upper level. And so that space was just filled with carols, but little used. So we were looking for ways to make it a little bit more useful for students. And we had pitched the idea of a shared lab, computer lab, in that space a couple years earlier, but for various reasons, it just didn't work out. So the timing seemed to be better, the relationships with ITAP were such that we could approach this new venture in a much more collaborative way. And so by uh, the fall semester of that 2002 year, we had the DLC up and running. It was the most amazing project I think I've ever worked on. It was, it was fast and furious, and it was a new direction for the library, and it was just exciting, and it was a lot of fun to be involved in. So ITAP uh, contributed all the equipment and much of the remodeling cost, uh, which was bringing in infrastructure basically, wiring and wireless connections and all that. 
and they committed student staff to uh, service that area who had technological expertise along with one AP position. The libraries committed a clerical and a faculty position to the DLC and that arrangement is continuing to this day. So it's just a way to try to bridge these two sets of competencies together and uh, it's been very successful in many ways. I think there are still ways to enhance the collaboration more. Um, in fact, it's formed the basis for what we hope to see in the future as a more expanded version of the DLC, basically integrating technology throughout the entire undergraduate library space, um, and, and therefore more services as well. Right. And, so, and it's used by a lot of the groups. Very much so. Uh, so you're doing a lot of instruction. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. so from that standpoint. And, and what that did was, it, since it was a unique facility for student use, it brought in new clientele. Uh, so where we were traditionally focusing in undergrad on freshman, sophomore level students, this brought in students from all levels, as well as graduate students and faculty. Mm -hmm. And so we had to start rethinking the way we served our, our, our patrons. And so it just kind of shifted some of the, the uh, collections that we did in undergrad. We started getting a lot more materials on software programs and applications, on ways of approaching multimedia development. Uh, and so, um, and just in the general usage of the space, where we have seen a, a shift in the kinds of people that are using it. So, um, Good. that's yeah, that's the DLC. Um, um, your core collection is that still pretty much the same though? Freshman for the most part. Um, okay. And here again, um, in the late '90s, we integrated the media collection into our general circulating collection. Prior to that time, it had been a collection mostly generated by faculty requests for classroom use. Now, students could check those materials out on their own, uh, which was an interesting circulation policy. It was a much more open policy than what I had seen in other locations or other libraries. But it was still in a closed area that people couldn't browse. Um, so it was, it was you down. Had to request you had to request it from a, uh, from a service desk and yeah. someone would get it for you. So in the late 90s, we moved that up to the open shelves and refocused our collection development uh, policy for that collection to be more actively seeking out resources that would be student-centered. Uh, putting them out on the open shelves, we were making them more available to students, and so we wanted them to have resources that they might use for their COM 114 papers or their English 106 papers or whatever. And so we shifted the scope of that collection a bit. Um, for wider access and availability. Right, right, right. Uh, the, the general collection, um, as I said, we, we started focusing a little bit more on technology-related issues and things like that, but for the most part, the, the scope of that collection has remained pretty consistent. It's basically an introductory level collection in all subject areas to help people get started on learning about a subject sure. area. And so that has remained constant throughout. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about G9, your instruction room, how that's changed a little bit okay. and how heavily. And that goes back to what you were talking about earlier, dear. you're real interested in instruction. Right, and right. When I first arrived, it was a room that was set up with folding tables and chairs, not folding chairs, but folding tables, and I think it had a few microform machines to be able to read at the time what was the serials list on microfiche. And that was uh, one of the things that was taught in our instruction uh, uh, classes to help people get access to that journal literature. And for several years, that's how it was. It was it, it sat maybe 30 students, and but there was no technology in the space at all. It, there was an overhead projector. That was the, the, the advanced technology we had. In fact, I think in the library when I first came, there was only one mechanical, <laughs> not even electronic, workstation. It was the information uh, info track, I think it was. Uh, which is a microform index uh, to I resources. That. Yeah, and <laughs> so within the first few years, we started adding, uh, you know, one workstation and then another four workstations, and we networked them together out in the reference area. But that didn't come into G959 until probably later into the mid 90s, and we finally got some probably 20 workstations in there. And that was a big deal. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, we had recently gotten the uh, online catalog, uh, system-wide online catalog, 
Now, the undergrad library had had its own online catalog from, I think, the beginning of its actually when it uh, opened. construction. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't online for the whole library system. The uh, media collection, which was called the AV Library and then the Instructional Media Center, had its own separate catalog online. And, uh, and then in the mid-90s, at some point, I can't remember exactly the year, we got an online catalog through Notice the first time, and that brought all of these together. So obviously, with the new system, all of our patrons needed to understand how to use it, so that became a real focus of our instruction efforts, is teaching them how to search in these online resources much more effectively. And so uh, we got the computers in there with an instructor workstation and an overhead projector, and we were able to do that. A few years later, other units around campus started realizing the value of that electronic classroom. And we called it the library's electronic classroom. Um, LEC. LEC, yep. And uh, so at one point, ITAP, I'm not sure if it was Puck at the time, the Purdue University Computing Center, or ITAP, which is the new reconfiguration of that division, um, came into a joint agreement with the libraries where they would purchase workstations every so many years in exchange for use of that space. This was a space that is, is in controlled use by the libraries, so we determine who can uh, use it and for what purposes. So we made that uh, agreement with them, and so every three years, I think, uh, the Computing Center or ITAP would buy new computers for that space. Uh, about four, well, actually it was when uh, Dean Emily Mobley left the libraries for her voluntary partial retirement that she made some funds available for special projects. And the undergrad library submitted a proposal to reconfigure that classroom to be m uh, more technologically advanced than it was. Actually, we initially requested more desktop workstations, but with additional software to be able to do uh, more distance learning kind of opportunities and uh, a video camera so that we could videotape sessions and, and post them online for people to view. Well. It didn't get uh, fully realized for several years after, and eventually it became a wireless lab uh, equipped with uh, 30 wireless laptops that are in a, a docking station after any session. And so uh, we got some what we call smart board software, which was an interactive whiteboard software installed in there, and um, it's become a much more flexible space now. Uh, before, we had these very uh, stationary workstations that were very large and workstations that were very large and uh, inhibited visibility in the class and in the, in the room. And so with the reconfiguration of what we now call the iLab, uh, which can be instructional lab or informational lab or wherever you want to interpret it. <laughs> Where you want to put, put the iLab, yeah, right? Yeah, right, right. Um, but it's got a lot, lot more flexibility. We bought chairs and tables all on wheels so that the, they can be reconfigured on a moment's notice to fit uh, auditorium style or small group styles or whatever. Um, this interactive whiteboard will allow people to write on the computer and or on the whiteboard and capture it. Um, we just tried to make it a lot more dynamic. And at the same time that we did this, um, now this classroom had always been restricted to classes that had some association with a librarian. At the point that we got this wireless lab, uh, lab in there, we decided to open it up to op general student use when it wasn't scheduled for instructional purposes. In and other so words, you could use it as a lab. That's right. That's right. That's right. And, and so now students have another semi-enclosed space if they want to go and talk about projects. Um, we had done a couple of surveys in, in the last several years with incoming students, or not necessarily incoming students, but just students in the library in the early part of the semesters. And one of the biggest comments we received, or most often received comments, was we want more study space. And With our computers? Or well, I was just going to say, okay. some wanted more individual quiet space, some wanted more collaborative space, and some wanted more computer spaces or workstations. So what we tried to do was just enhance and maximize the potential spaces that we had. And so rather than having this room 
sit unused when it wasn't scheduled for classes, we decided to open it up for students to use. And I think it's been very successful for them you know, taking advantage of it. Right. So. Um, a couple, any other, some other notes that you got on the undergrad? Your staff has increased. Uh, uh, somewhat, actually. The, the numbers have been somewhat steady. There's just been a lot of shifting of responsibilities. When we opened the DLC, for example, we reconfigured a position to become sort of a, a billing clerk for the checkout equipment that we have down there because we check out video cameras and digital cameras and laptops and other pieces of equipment. And so we have billing issues and inventory issues with all that equipment. So this person supports that. Right. So that actually was a position that used to be devoted to, I think, maybe reserves. We used to have a couple people devoted to reserve processing. Um, we had one of our reference assistants who was primarily devoted to the acquisitions process. That has become so much more streamlined that we didn't need that full-time position. So uh, that individual happened to leave, and we didn't fill it in the same way. And so there's been shifting. But fairly steady, uh, about 12 to 13 staff members in undergrad. We have added two new faculty positions in the undergraduate library since I've been there. And again, responsibilities have shifted as the environment has changed. Sure. We now have a digital reference service that is falls within the auspices of the undergraduate library. And so the coordinator of that service was a new responsibility for undergrad. Um, when the DLC opened, one of our faculty positions was converted to what we call the information integration librarian. And so that was a new focus for us. And at one point, um, early to mid-90s, there was a new position created called the User Instruction Librarian. And that position, while it was based in the undergraduate library, was really meant to have more broader system-wide uh, activities on developing our instruction program as a library system. That has uh, remained in the undergraduate library as well. So we now have, I think, uh, six faculty positions two administrative professional positions. We've added an operations manager who has been there as well as a, an instructional designer. And so we, we have another faculty position that has been unfilled for a few years that was intended to be a new position. And we just haven't had the funds to do that yet. Sure. So okay. um, if we had a full complement, I think we would have about 21 staff in the undergrad library at this point okay. in time. And are your students in two? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, quite a few uh, students. The, um, your, the 24 hour <coughs> service, that's really, that's been a long time. And Dad, and I'd like you to talk about undergrounds. Okay, okay. Uh, well, the, un the 24 hour service was kind of an extension of um, some extended hours that undergrad implemented back in. Again, the early 90s, I don't have the exact date, but we at one point went from being open until 10 p.m. to extending that to 2 a.m. during the Sunday through Thursday days of the week, um, pretty much at student request. A couple years after we implemented that, student government approached the libraries and asked for more extended hours, specifically looking at 24-hour access during the last two weeks of the semester what was called dead week and finals week. And so it was in 1996 that we first offered 24-hour service in the undergraduate library. And we did this really trying to look at it as a system-wide effort. And so rather than just undergraduate library staff um, providing this service, we actually uh, put out a call for volunteers each semester asking for anybody in the libraries to volunteer to work those extra hours. So uh, at the time it would have been from 2 a.m. to 8 a.m. as additional hours for us to be open. And so uh, from the very start, we have always had a strong response to that. I think staff- Many of the same people too. Right? That's right, that's right, Which is okay. that's right. Um, now there was certainly, they were getting paid oh, time sure. and a half for that. Right. But they also commented often on the camaraderie that it built in exposing them to other staff members from other locations throughout the system that they never had a chance to visit with before. And so here they were working during uh, not a real busy kind of environment, and so they got to know the staff uh, around the system better as well. And I think that was a real strong uh, component of this. Of the uh, let me interject, but at the same time, you've always had the 24 study line. That's right, right. that's so right. 
That's so right. So for the researchers, the library and the study lounge were adjacent, but the study lounge was different. That's right. Uh, That's right. It was um, open all hours. Uh, it had a few vending machines in there for late night snacks and things like that, but it was across the lobby from the, the main entrance of the library. Right. Okay. Um, in the recent years, about uh, I think it was about three years ago, we began cons reconsidering the whole configuration of the study lounge. And that leads to the undergrounds. That leads to undergrounds, yeah. right. Uh, we decided to consider the option of putting in a coffee shop. Um, as student study behaviors started shifting, um, there was a real realization that students were wanting a more comfortable environment that was a more integrated environment with uh, kind of how they worked. And there wasn't all these distinct lines between the different spaces they occupied throughout a given day. So um, uh, we decided to look into the idea of in implementing a coffee shop in undergrad. And we were able to get the funding for that. And we, uh, in 2006 of April, we opened up a, a brand new coffee shop, which the food service part of it is being run by the union. But we also reconfigured the study space to be a much more modern and well-equipped uh, space for studying, much more inviting than it had been. And we also, as a part of that, opened up a new entrance directly into the library from the study lounge so that what we were trying to do was kind of reinforce this notion that there's this kind of uh, dynamic flow between all the activities and ways of studying and, and learning about information. So um, we opened up uh, a doorway into the library proper directly from underground so that uh, you can go from the coffee shop into the undergraduate library where we now house our contemporary literature collection, our current magazines and newspaper collections. And then you can move on into the spaces that have all the other technologies and resources and things available. So um, again, it's been uh, well received. Um, I think it, it has made the whole space much more inviting and um, following along with the expectations of our, of our students anymore. Right, yeah. So, Let's switch a little bit to the Diversity Fellows Program because well, the researchers, he, he and along with Becky Richardson and other colleagues were the co-chairs of this inaugural program, uh, 06 to 08. Right, right. Um, my involvement in this Diversity Fellowship Program stemmed originally from we were looking to hire a position, a faculty position in the undergraduate library and we were really interested in trying to broaden the diversity of our staff and so we had been um, working hard to uh, increase the diversity of our applicant pools in this position and we were finding that we weren't getting a lot of applications from uh, people from underrepresented groups and so um, in a conversation I was having with Nancy Hewison, who is the Associate Dean for Planning and, administration. and Administrative Services, um, they were talking about this uh, program that they were developing in association with the Association of Research Libraries, which was a, a program they had for uh, people from underrepresented groups that would visit the library to learn about academic librarianship as part of a, a bigger program that ARL was uh, uh, sponsoring. And so Purdue Libraries was working on that and in the course of the conversation I had mentioned that I was really supportive of that program and had suggested the idea of creating a fellowship for a, a, a diversity uh, librarian at some point earlier and the idea just kind of grew from that and uh, in late 2005 Nancy Hewison, Rebecca Richardson and myself got together to start writing a grant proposal to the IMLS which is the Institute for Museum and Library Services I think is the right name and we submitted a grant to support and fund this diversity fellowship program. Our initial intent was to bring in two or three fellows who were recent graduates with an accredited MLS uh, from an underrepresented group that would bring in diversity into the profession, bring in diversity to the Purdue libraries, as well as help these um, underrepresented groups 
uh, get more involved in the profession overall and, and more acclimated to leadership opportunities. In, the acad in an academic library. In an academic right? library, that's sure. right, that's right. And so in August of 2006, uh, while the program didn't get funded, uh, the library's administration had committed to funding the program for the first cohort, and so we began um, advertising the position in early 2006, and we interviewed a number, uh, we had a good pool of applicants. Uh, well, I think, it, if I remember right, it was over 80-some applications for the three positions that we were advertising. And the pool was so strong that we actually ended up hiring four fellows in this first year. Um, we worked on uh, a, 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 what, a structure for the program that we thought was working to combine flexibility with structure for these new graduates. And so we allowed these applicants to let us know what areas of librarianship they were interested in pursuing. And we wanted to create a series of rotations whereby they could go into different units of the libraries that would focus on those interest areas. And so we set up a rotation schedule for their first year of the program in which they could spend, uh, it varied the time frames, but depending on the individual, anywhere from three to six months in any given unit or library within the system uh, to kind of immerse themselves in that area and learn a little bit more about that field or that subfield of librarianship. And in the course of that first year, we also assigned them mentors. And we had a system of what we called primary mentors and resource mentors, trying to give them as many resources available to learn more about librarianship. And so we had regular meetings with these groups of people to try to you know, foster relationships and, and help these uh, new librarians develop networks, both within the library system and the profession at large. Their second year then was to be focused on a, a more concentrated area of specialization and resulting in a capstone project. And so uh, these librarians, fellows, what we call them as fellows, diversity fellows, chose an area based on their interest areas, uh, much of which was learned in that first year after having been exposed to some of these different areas. And they basically settled into that unit for the full second year. And we had, um, they, let's see, we had a couple of fellows in the Archives and Special Collections unit. Uh, we had one in the undergraduate library and also one in the humanities library. Um, overall, I think the fellows really helped the libraries in fostering new relationships with groups around campus. Um, in particular, the cultural centers. Right. Two of the fellows worked with two of the different cultural centers on the campus. Ones. I was going to say, one was the Latino Cultural Center, which was only three or four years old maybe at this time, and another one worked with the Native American Educational and Cultural Center, which really just started up in the past year, year and a half now. And so she was in on the ground floor of, of getting that cultural center started. So uh, the libraries is right there. and so. They developed programming and resources and uh, developed collections for these different groups. And um, I think it was a really positive experience. Right. And yeah. so it's a good, good program. Yeah, yeah. Right. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about awards and honors. You got the John H. Moriarty Award. Yep. And also the most recent one, the Special Boiler Maker. That's right, that's right. Congratulations. Yep. How Thank did you. you. Find, uh, did they let you, tell us how you were advised of both of those? Let you uh, well, the Moriarty Award is a, the award for excellence in library service. Right. Um, uh, it's given out usually annually to a, a librarian, a faculty librarian, uh, based on nominations from other faculty librarians here at Purdue. Um, so I think I got this in 2000. I think that was right after we had, uh, well, a year or two after we had come out with um, the core tutorial, which was an online research tutorial that I was the primary developer for. And so that, coupled with my strong instructional emphasis and all the instruction that I had done, I think, was really the basis for my getting that award. I was, I was very proud of that, very happy about that. <laughs> and his name is, uh, we have so a plaque, a permanent plaque yeah, in the library. Yeah, yeah. And then recently, um, just over the summer, um, in fact, I came back from a two-week vacation, and the first day back, 
I was summoned uh, under the ruse of needing to deal with the patron issue and I went to the workspace that uh, a number of people were gathered and some people who I didn't recognize started reading this uh, proclamation or whatever you want to call it uh, from the nomination for me as uh, the Special Boilermaker Award. And this is an award that is um, awarded to any Purdue staff or faculty member who has gone above and beyond basically to enhance student life or uh, the, the educational experience for students. And so I, I was honored enough to get that award this and year. And it was, and let me interject, it was presented at the football game and you did very well and you're on the jumbotron and everybody <laughs> saw you. It was really good. I was there so I know. Oh, okay, I was okay. There. Uh, um, how about family? Do you want to make a couple comments on your family? You've got your wife that works uh, with the university. Right. Uh, my wife uh, is a veterinary technician in the small animal surgery unit at Purdue and I have four daughters, uh, a stepdaughter and a stepson. Uh, my stepson is living locally here in Lafayette. He works at Purdue and is going part-time for hopefully a degree in Greek uh, or classical studies, uh, somewhere in that area. My stepdaughter is, uh, received a master's degree in social work from Indiana University and she's currently working in Indianapolis as a social worker. My oldest daughter is working as a research assistant at the Veteran Affairs uh, Administration in um, San Diego, California. Uh, she's going to school part-time uh, out there, working towards a degree in psychology. And my second oldest daughter is in Oregon. She's working on a certificate in Master Herbalism, which she's doing through an online program, and she expects to get that certificate this fall. And so that's exciting. And then I have two other daughters. One is a, a junior at Ball State University, majoring in Spanish and Latin American studies. And then my youngest daughter just started going to Indiana University this fall, majoring in journalism. Okay, so, staying in Indiana. Yep, they're pretty much Indiana kids. Right. <laughs> so. Do you want to talk about an outstanding event in your life? Uh, you know. Or a favorite tradition? The thing, the, the. Or so. Or well, the favorite tradition, I can, t I can tell you right off bat. I, I know what that one is. Good. Um, in the undergraduate library, we had done, uh, kind of established a tradition some years ago of every year, once or twice throughout the year, we would kind of come up with some event or outing with the staff. And one year we decided uh, to just be completely off the wall and we arranged to have the Boilermaker Special available for taking the staff of the undergraduate library from campus across town to the Dog and Suds drive-in. <laughs> and, and just driving through town on that Boilermaker special where the, you know, they're playing the Purdue theme song and uh, it, it, was, it was just great fun. And actually we've done that a few times since that first time that we did it. And so um, that's been, that, that was a fun Purdue tradition for me. Right. One other tradition that I've really appreciated is just the big Christmas tree in the Union every year. I just love going in there at that time and seeing this huge tree filling up that central hall and, and you smell the, the, the pine or whatever scent it is and I just love it. So that's something that I will always remember too. <laughs> so those well, have been good come things. To any closing comments and, uh, as you look back on undergrad? I, I would just say I think um, the undergraduate library to me has been a real blessing in my career. Um, I think it has been a, 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 an exceptional match for my interests and my passions for where the profession needs to direct some of its attention. Um, my philosophy has always been about helping students. I mean, I think that has really been kind of foundational to everything I do. And the undergraduate library has given me the opportunities to really develop services and hopefully a staff that understands that and um, really brings that to fruition and, and we are, our, our goal is to make the library experience uh, accessible and inviting to students since we're oftentimes the first the undergraduate library is oftentimes the first exposure some of these students have to a major research library system I think it's critical that we have people who understand that undergraduate psyche and can help make that transition to 
the more advanced library resources and often a little that's bit easier. First initial contact. Uh, exactly. And exactly. Even when they come for a day on campus. So I have so much appreciated the time that I've been here. I've I learned so much in so many different ways, and it's just been been great fun. So thank you, Scott. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. I appreciate it. Very good.